is it sensory or is it behavior? A discussion on why some kids act like they do and whether those behaviors are sensory based or other. So I am Beth Tenace. I am an occupational therapist at Bothell Pediatric and Hand Therapy. So we're going to start with the definition of occupational therapy. Occupational therapy enables people of all ages to live life to its fullest by helping them to promote health, make lifestyle or environmental changes, and prevent or live better with injury, illness, and disabilities. By looking at the whole picture, including a client's psychological, physical, emotional, and social makeup, occupational therapy assists people to achieve their goals, function at the highest possible level, maintain or rebuild their independence, and participate in everyday activities of life. Uh, that is the really, really long definition of occupational therapy. Shorthand, occupational therapy helps people live their life to the fullest. Uh, it's even on our t-shirts. So this is me, Beth Nace. Uh, I went to the State University of New York at Buffalo for occupational therapy, and I've spent the last 10 years working with children with sensory and behavior problems. Before I started working here in Bothell, I worked in Buffalo for a school specifically for children with autism and so have a lot of experience with sensory needs. So what is the sensory system? Well, we have our basic five senses, sight, touch, hearing, tasting, and smelling. And then we have the two quote-unquote hidden senses of proprioception and vestibular. And these two senses give us our sense of speed, movement, pressure on joints and muscles, and where our body's in space. So proprioception is the sense we get from our muscles and our connective tissue that really tells us the position of our body. If you're sitting down, you know you're sitting down, even if your eyes are closed, because of uh, the position of your legs, the feeling of the chair underneath your thighs, that kind of thing. Your vestibular system is your sense of movement. It's how you know that you're moving in a car, even with your eyes closed. Uh, if you close your eyes in a car, you know if you're going straight versus backwards versus turning, that kind of thing. And when those things go wrong, it, it gets interesting. So what is behavior? Well, here's the definition. Behavior, A, the manner of conducting oneself. B. Anything that an organism does involving action and response to stimulation. C. The response of an individual, group, or species to its environment. The way in which something behaves, also an instance of such behavior. Or the way in which something functions or operates. So generally, behavior is anything we do in response to anything else. Whether we laugh because somebody told us a funny joke, we cry because we're watching the beginning of the movie up, or we sneeze because something tickled our nose. Treatments for behavior include behavioral modification, medication, psychotherapy, family counseling, parent training, and dietary changes. Now, medication can be very... Um, controversial, especially in young children. Uh, personally, I believe that with very, very young children, we should try other things first, uh, just because it, they're fairly harsh chemicals. However, having had a lot of experience with behavioral difficulties, I can kind of argue for both sides. Uh, sometimes medication is very necessary to just help uh, calm a person down enough for them to learn how to better manage their own behaviors and uh, once those skills are in place, medication can sometimes be eased off. Uh, however, I, I do not think medication is necessarily bad or necessarily good. It is a tool that is uh, at times very, very functional. So here again are our five senses, uh, our five regular senses, I should say, plus our two hidden senses. And when they're put together, they create uh, sensory integration. And what is that, you might ask? Well, sensory integration or sensory processing is how we transform sensory information from within our own bodies and the external environment into messages we can act on. So we think of sensations as food for the brain, providing energy and knowledge needed to direct the body and mind. 
we take all the information from the outside world, how it looks, how it feels, how it smells, and then we take what our bodies are telling us, whether we're walking or running or sitting down or wrapped up in a blanket, and we use it to make sense of the world, and we use that to figure out how we should act upon the world. So Jane Ayers, who pretty much helped found how we understand how the brain takes in and processes sensory information, described our senses as giving us information about the physical conditions of our body and the environment around us. Sensations flow into our brains like streams flowing into a lake. Countless bits of sensory information enter our brains at every moment, not only from our eyes and our ears, but also from every place in our bodies. The brain must then organize all of these sensations if a person is to move and learn and behave normally. The brain locates, sorts, and orders sensations somewhat as a traffic policeman directs moving cars. What sensations flow in a excuse me, when sensations flow in a well-organized or integrated manner, the brain uses those sensations to form perceptions, behaviors, and learning. When the flow of sensation is disorganized, life can be like a rush hour traffic jam. So another way to look at it is if our senses are streams providing water to a lake, sometimes those streams flood and we have too much information, and sometimes they, they get blocked up providing little to no information, and thus the lake either overflows or goes through a drought. Uh, sensory processing disorder, as defined by Lucy J. Miller, is a condition that exists when sensory signals don't get organized into appropriate responses. So again, something's going on with those streams. Pioneering occupational therapist and neuroscientist A. Jane Ayers likened SPD to a neurological traffic jam that prevents certain parts of the brain from receiving the information needed to interpret sensory information correctly. A person with SPD finds it difficult to process and act upon information received through the senses. This creates challenges in performing countless everyday tasks. Motor clumsiness, behavioral problems, anxiety, depression, school failure, and other impacts can result from the disorder if it is not treated effectively. So at the top of this page, you can see a website to a place called the SPD Foundation, and they provide a lot of helpful information on sensory processing disorder and how it's treated. So SPD is a complex disorder of the brain and it affects the way sensations are experienced and organized. The daily lives of at least 1 in 20 children are affected with SPD and that's 5% of the general population and one child in every classroom. Now more than that, these are, these are the kids with SPD. Almost everyone has some sensory thing that they are, for lack of a better word, weird about. Uh, for example, when I was a child, it would take me forever to put on my socks because they didn't feel right. And at five years old, I could not explain to my mother what the problem was in anything other than yelling at her and saying that they hurt. She didn't understand, and it wasn't until many, many years later, like five years ago, that I was actually able to tell her exactly what was going on with my socks. I'm sure everybody listening to this can think of one thing that they dislike that other people have no problem with. Uh, in children with autism, the incidence of uh, SPD is estimated to be even higher, at least 80%. I agree with that at least in my experience uh, working with children with autism. Every one of them seemed to have a difficult time processing sensory information in at least one area, if not more. SPD is believed to occur in about 30% of gifted children as well. This disorder has unique symptoms that cannot be explained by other known conditions, so it's often misdiagnosed. Sometimes as attention difficulties because sensory processing does lead to attention difficulties. But it's something where if you get those sensations under control, you see that no, they really do not have a problem focusing on schoolwork or that kind of thing as long as their sensory needs are being met. Studies indicate that occupational therapy is an effective intervention for treating children with SPD, and children with SPD who reach adulthood without receiving treatment will continue to be affected by sensory challenges. 
So areas of the brain, uh, so we have our limbic system, which is the emotional center of the brain, and it really is actually the center of the brain. Uh, it regulates emotional responses and emotional growth and is the key for fight, fight, flight, and fear reaction. So this is really, really the primitive area of the brain. It's worried about survival. So if our emotional growth, if our sensory growth is not where it should be, then this area will take over and we'll just try and keep the body safe. And we have our cerebral cortex. That is the big wheelie hunk that we all think of when we think of the brain. It's the area for visual perception, sound processing, speech processing, both receptive and expressive, voluntary motor control of the body and the eyes, and uh, where we keep our maps for both movement and sensation for the entire body. Then we have the cerebellum that sits at the bottom of the brain and it looks like a big old hunk of cauliflower. And it has processes all types of sensations, especially useful for organizing gravity, movement, and muscle joint sensations. It is what makes our movements smooth and accurate. When there is damage to the cerebellum, you get what are called intention tremors, where when you think about doing something, your hands or legs or whatever portion of you you are trying to move start shaking. Uh, this is what makes our movements nice and smooth and easy. And finally, there's the brainstem, which has all of the body's basic functions regulated right there. And here is a lovely picture of all of those bits that I talked about, as well as a few others. So you guys can take your time and explore that a little more. A few facts about SPD. So many children with sensory integration problems have above uh, or normal intelligence. Children with sensory integration dysfunctions often develop in an uneven way, and that can be because uh, with one sensation not working quite correctly, they'll focus on the other areas that do function correctly and they do have the proper skills for. So they'll get really good in one area and continue to have really poor skills in another. Children with sensory integration dysfunctions often have low muscle tone or may seem weak. These kids are, re they seem really floppy uh, or uh, they're kind of our silly putty kids where, you know, they're really flexible but not very strong. And if they're unable to hold a prone extension position, we often have problems integrating gravity and movement sensations. So prone extension can be seen in these pictures right here. It's when you're resting on your tummy and you can stretch your arms and your legs straight out. We call it the Superman stretch. Now if you look at the child on the scooter board in the middle column, or sorry, in the middle on the right column when you're looking at the screen, you can see she has a lot of trouble working against gravity. Her hands are flat and splayed. She's trying to give herself as much help as she can. She's having a hard time holding her head up. And if you look closely at her body, she's probably rocking the entire th body as she's just trying to move her arms. because so it looks like she's about ready to roll off the scooter right there. But this activity itself is good for her because it will strengthen her upper body as well as her neck and back and give her the experience of working against gravity which will help integrate those sensations. So here's a great picture it's, uh, about sensational kids. All of the problems that will come out when you have different sensory things and if you look at some of these you're really gonna find at least one kid if not more that you know. So being a picky eater, uh, like they're, you put something new on their plate and they're like, nope, not going to touch that. Uh, complaining about tags on their clothing, everybody does this. Uh, if you were here for my full lecture, we actually talked about how I would nominate the person who invented the tagless undershirt for Nobel Prize if I knew how. Some kids don't want to be touched ever. They don't want to be tickled. They don't want to be cuddled. They don't want to be hugged. If some, if they're standing in line and somebody bumps into them, they may react badly by yelling, pushing, or hitting the other child. Other kids have no problem being touched. They don't seem to realize they're being touched. These kids will show up with bruises and not even notice. They have no idea where they came from because they probably ran into the table and didn't realize it. 
uh, please take your time and read over some more of these and see if you can recognize some of those symptoms in kids you know or yourself. So here we have how sensory processing works more or less. So in the green, the stimuli enters your sight, smell, touch, taste, sound, your movement, your balance, uh, where your body is in space, uh, and your general awareness of your body. And so all of that goes into the body to be modulated and integrated. And sometimes things go wrong. We can be hypersensitive or over-responsive. You can be hyposensitive or under-responsive. Uh, which can also lead to sensation seeking or avoiding. And when one of these things happens, we get the red column over here where we have behavioral results that include poor focus and attention leading to diagnoses of ADHD and ADD, learning problems, learning specific learning disabilities, auditory and visual processing such as dyslexia or dysgraphia, difficulties with coordination, problems with posture control, oppositional defiant disorder, OCD, as, and social problems are just being labeled the bad kid. So here's a look at sensory processing disorder and how it can be broken down. Uh, and we'll get to some more information on all of these terms on our next slide. So sensory modulation disorders are problems with turning sensory messages into controlled behaviors that match the nature and intensity of sensory information. Sensory over sensory over responsivity or sensory defensiveness is uh, where a child responds to a sensory message more intensely, quicker, or for longer periods of time for a typical child. So these are the kids that Maybe they only wear sweatpants and t-shirts. Uh, they don't like their socks. They don't like their shoes. They, anytime you tap them on the shoulder, they may yell because you hit them. A loud noise startles them and they start to cry because it was too loud. They really didn't like it. Then we have the sensory under-responsivity, which uh, is, also called hyposensitivity. These kids have less of a response to sensory info than the situation demands and they take longer to react and require high intensity or longer lasting input before they react. So these are the kids that uh, don't really seem to have any personal space. They'll get right up in your face because they don't mind and they don't understand why you might they bump into things they might be clumsy because they're not really feeling their bodies so they didn't even they didn't even notice the curb was there until they were face down on the pavement um and these are also the kids where you call them over and over and over again and it's not until you actually approach them and put your hand on their shoulder that they look up and it's not that they were ignoring you it's that they honestly didn't hear you of course, in this day and age, sometimes that just means they have the tablet on. Then we have sensory seeking kids, and these are the kids with the nearly insatiable craving for sensory experiences, and they're constantly looking at it, so looking for it, sometimes in really inappropriate manners. Like they, these kids just look weird because they're jumping or they're wiggling. Uh, they might be chewing on their shirt, so you'll get the, you know, damp, they'll have holes or damp patches in their cuffs and collars. Uh, they might flap, they might, they might get up and run for no apparent reason when we ask them why they did it. They can't tell you. Again, they're not trying to be quote-unquote bad. They're not trying to disobey. They're not trying to make you mad. They just need this input and they don't understand that there are better ways to get it. They need to, they need help learning that. Then we have sensory based motor disorders, which are problems with stabilizing, moving, or planning a series of movements in response to sensory demands. So we've got dyspraxia, which is difficulty translating sensory information into physical movement, unfamiliar movements, or plan multi-step sequences. And of course this can affect gross motor, fine motor, and oral motor. Dyspraxia literally just means inability to move. Um, these kids just do not have the ability to see someone do something like cli climb a 
piece of playground equipment or do jumping jacks uh, and then translate it themselves. They need things broken down very simply and they need a lot of practice. Be just their systems are not wired to plan those. So new activities are very difficult and very scary for them. Uh, this section also has postural disorders, which is a difficulty in maintaining enough control of their bodies to meet demands of a motor task, uh, often having poor muscle tone and inability to stabilize themselves. Uh, these kids are like little puddles. They slouch. If they're doing writing, they may be spread out across, like, their bottoms may be in the chair, but the tops of them are spread across the table and they've got their head down while they're trying to write. Uh, they may just slide out of their chair because their core muscles are weak and sitting up tall is difficult for them. And then there's sensory discrimination disorder, which is a problem with senses, similarities and differences between sensations in one or more of several systems, such as touch, vision, hearing, taste, smell, perception of body movements, such as vestibular and proprioceptive things. So these kids have a hard time being able to see items in a busy background. Uh, they're not going to want to play I Spy. They might have trouble realizing that you know, something is touching them lightly versus firmly. It's all the same to them. Same if they're touching someone else. That kind of thing. So now we're going to look at hypersensitivity versus hyposensitivity. So uh, both of these can be in one sense or a combination of the two. For that matter, you can have one sense that is hypersensitive and one that is hyposensitive. Uh, so hypersensitive is experiencing some experiencing something more strongly than others and hyposensitivity is experiencing things less strongly than others. So hypersensitivity, all the stuff is in red. These kids tend to be high anxiety. They're rigid and rule bound. That's because to them experiences the world in general is really scary. So they want to be rigid and know what's going on so they know when to to either be ready for an experience that is going, they have trouble with, whether it's you know getting a haircut or putting on socks, uh, or they want to know that one of those scary things is just not going to happen. Then they also have difficulty with transitions for the same reasons I just mentioned with the rigidity. Uh, they avoid messy play. They don't want sticky stuff on their hands or their face. They're perfectionists. They want everything to be done just so. And if it's not just so, there's going to be a problem. So when working with these kids, you want to focus on helping to teach the process, not the finished product. Uh, we don't care what the drawing looks like at the end as long as they try to do it. You want to help them at first, but make yourself look so bad and unskilled at whatever activity you're trying to do that they kind of get fed up with you and finish it. You want a very calm environment with quiet music and soft lighting. And heavy work is an excellent tool for these kids. Heavy work is anything where you use your big muscles to push, pull, climb. And it's very relaxing and very organizing. I always recommend doing heavy work before the activity that it, these kids don't like is high anxiety. And then after, because you want them calm when they start but this is an activity that's going to be difficult so at the end they're probably going to be stressed out and you want to help them relax again. So your hyposensitive kids uh, have a failure to sense danger. A lot of them have a decreased sense of pain uh, so they don't really understand that just because they don't feel that bruise doesn't mean they shouldn't get it checked out. Speaking of bruises, these kids get bumps and bruises all the time and they have no idea where or when. They don't notice them. Plus, they very frequently run into tables, door jams, other people, that kind of thing. They have poor spatial awareness of their body and they lack personal space. Again, they bump into things a lot. They just, they don't have a personal bubble. Uh, they have dirty hands and faces. They don't realize when they're dirty. These are the kids that when they come home from school, you can tell immediately what was served for lunch because they have spaghetti sauce on one side of their face and chocolate pudding on the other. They tend to be clumsy with poor bilateral skills and tool use, such as cutting food or writing. 
because they don't really know where their hands or their feet are in relationship to the rest of the body, it makes it very difficult for them to plan how to move them appropriately to catch a ball or write a sentence or tie their shoes. For these kids, you want to focus on increasing frequency, intensity, and duration of the input. So things like vibration, Play-Doh, tracing during writing over sandpaper for increased feedback or resistance, have them write in the clay or in the Play-Doh. Uh, you can just use a regular pencil for that, or even a pen that doesn't have the ink thing in it. Works great. Uh, heavy work is also helpful for organizing, but you need to add vestibular movement as well in order to just help wake up the system more. So once you've kind of figured your kid out, you want to start creating a sensory diet. Uh, sensory diets care are carefully designed and personalized to each child's individual needs. Uh, activity is scheduled to provide sensory input to help stay focused and organized. So you need to do your detective work first. You need to ask yourself several questions and figure out things in order to make an effective sensory diet. So here are the questions to ask. One, has my child had an OT evaluation including an up-to-date sensory profile? A sensory profile is a specific evaluation that is a checklist for either a parent or a child to fill out depending on the child's age. And it really breaks down the sensory systems and what areas, if any, are problem areas. Uh, you also want to look at when the problem times of day are for your child. When do they need the most help? When are they getting into trouble? Think of the age of your child. Uh, older kids, you can get them set up with a sensory diet and they can really buy into it and kind of figure it out for themselves. They can be responsible for their sensory diet. Uh, younger children are going to need more help. They're not going to have the same self-monitoring skills. You're also going to need, want to know what specific events are coming up that they have to deal with, whether it's school picture day, uh, a haircut, a doctor's appointment, or uh, I'm recording this in mid-December, so we're all getting ready for the big Christmas holidays, and this is a really rough time for sensory kids. And finally, do you understand your child's sensory difficulties and how they are affecting his or her life? Uh, once you get these questions more or less figured out, we start providing sensory input for all the different sensory systems, including proprioception, which again is your sensation from your joints, muscles, and connective tissue that leads to your body awareness. You know where your body is in space and where your body is in relationship to everything else. So you want to use heavy work for this which is pushing, pulling, lifting, tugging, carrying, distraction and compression of your joints, squeezes and squishes. So one of my favorite things to do is to make a, a child sandwich. You have a cushion on the bottom, you put a child in the middle and then a cushion on top and push down as much as the child needs to. I, I, have, lay I have lain down on cushions on top of children. I, so this works as a child panini press and the children will tell you if they need more or less like is this you can occasionally ask like is this good or do you need more pressure and they'll tell you and they'll tell you if there's it's too much pressure because they'll say things like I can't breathe even if they can uh, or they'll they'll you know start fighting a little bit so then we have the burrito which you roll a child up in a blanket nice and tight. You make it fun by adding toppings before rolling. So the toppings can be pillows, other blankets, toys, that kind of thing. Soft toys, hard toys are just going to be painful. Finally, yeah, we have chores. Really, chores are wonderful heavy work uh, depending on the age of the child. They can push the laundry basket to the washing machines, they can carry things up or down the stairs, uh, they can vacuum if they're too young to vacuum, they can push the furniture out of the way, they can sweep, they can mop, do windows, put them to work. And finally you can also make a caterpillar cloth tunnel which is just a seamless tube of cloth about nine feet or more long with an 18 inch wide um, mouth. Uh, you can just buy some stretchy material at 
most fabric stores and sew one yourself. And the kids can just crawl back and forth through it. You can put puzzle pieces or other things in there for them to find. Most kids will figure out how to make a game for it, and they'll tell you. Then we're going to add stuff for the vestibular system, your sense of movement, the inner ear, uh, which is obtained by spinning and swinging. So you always want to start with low intensity and build up as the child can tolerate. We've got linear back and forth movement, rotational, which is spinning, and a combination. Now, before you start doing this, know what you're doing before you do it because you can cause unintended consequences such as headaches, uh, intense dizziness, nausea, and vomiting. And you don't want to do that. Cleaning up is no fun. And the kids aren't going to want to do it. And the kids aren't going to enjoy it either. So know your kids' limits, but also keep an eye on them. If you notice uh, overly flushed, uh, dilated eyes, or, you know, loss of blood flow. I mean, if the child gets really pale, you probably want to stop or at least slow down. Just be aware, it's for safety. So, now that we've warned you about that, where can we get this vestibular stuff? Well, first, playground swings. If you can find them, they're starting to disappear and that's always annoying. Bikes, scooters, monkey bars, and trampolines are wonderful. Sit and spin toys, the merry-go-round, tire swings, roller coasters, trapeze swings, um, and then you've got all your different types of swings, which are usually single point, double point, and rotator swings. So if you look at this picture here, uh, the tire swing in the tree and the little girl swinging uh, and in the top left corner are both single point swings. These require a lot of core strength and they might spin a little bit depending on how they're tied or set up. Uh, then in the middle left you can see a bunch of three boys on a tire swing. That's a rotator. Uh, that is going to give you intense spinning as well as combination of spinning and linear movement. Uh, those are the ones you want to look out for. Uh, they also require a lot of core strength. Two-point swings are the little girl in the hammock and the typical playground swings here. Uh, those provide nice linear movement as opposed to a combination of the two and tend to be really stable. Something like the hammock swing especially are good for beginners who are a little more fearful of movement. So now we're going to move on to tactile, which is our sense of touch and includes texture, temperature, pressure, and all the combinations thereof. With tactile input, you always want to respect the child's need to avoid. If you push it, you'll lose them for a long time, and by a long time I'm talking months at least. So go slow. Find ways to integrate something they like. Uh, sit next to them and play with them. You're going to have to get your hands dirty too. Uh, and if you, you know, encourage, start with fingertips. You know, even just like, oh, just touch it and then have something where they can wipe their hands off. So they're just starting it and let them set the pace. Uh, another thing we can do with this is messy play. So we've got shaving cream, finger paint, glue, gack, magic mud. You can add colors or sand to all of these items to give it a different look or feel. Uh, some easier things to start with include Play-Doh, clay, dry beans, or rice. Play-Doh and clay are thicker. They're not as damp or sticky. Uh, clay can be a little difficult, but Play-Doh is nice because even though there is texture and a little bit of dampness, it does not stick to your hands. It doesn't leave much of a residue. Dry beans, rice, sand, that kind of thing are also nice because again, they're dry, they're not sticky, which are usually harder for kids to deal with. Water play is always fun. You can use bath time for this with lots of different, you know, pouring toys, squirt toys, sponges. This is also wonderful in the summer. You can get a kiddie pool or a large storage bin, put it in the yard, fill it with water, and add little squirt toys and send the kids out in their bathing suits. Um, Temperature-wise, warm things, especially drinks like hot chocolate or warm milk, are calming. And frozen things like popsicles or cold orange juice 
are alerting. So giving kids who have a hard time waking up cold orange juice with ice cubes in the morning is a great way to get them started. Okay, tags and clothing. I mentioned this before. I absolutely love that most underwear and t-shirts no longer have tags in them. We don't have to worry about them itching. We don't have to try and cut them out and hope that we don't accidentally take out the stitching and all that other stuff. Then we have things called SPIO weighted vests and pressure vests. These are our specialized articles of clothing that give gentle deep pressure throughout the day. SPIO and pressure vests do this through deep pressure. They, uh, SPIO is made from very thick lycra and it provides deep pressure. Pressure vests are very similar. They just are only a vest as opposed to SPIO, which can be a long or short sleeve shirt or a pair of pants. Uh, the nice thing about these is that they can be worn all day. The weighted vest provides this information or input through being heavy. There's a certain amount of weight in there. They're a little more difficult. They're a little more specialized because that has to the weight has to be calibrated based on the weight of the person wearing it, and the body will get used to the weight. So the vests have to be taken on and off periodically throughout the day usually 30 minutes on, 30 minutes off. We've got vibration, handheld massagers are a wonderful thing. Brushing and joint compressions are a very powerful tool for stimulating and organizing the nervous system. Uh, we have several therapists here who are more than willing to consult with you to train you on brushing because brushing is a specific tool and method to change how the neurological system functions, we highly recommend uh, consul consultation and training before you start it with your child. So now we're gonna look at the auditory system, which is what we hear and how it is processed and interpreted in the brain. This is connected to the vestibular system. Uh, the vestibular system is primarily in the inner ear with our semicircular canals. And so, of course, our cochlea and all the stuff that actually processes the auditory input is right next to it, so of course they interact. So listening to music can be calming or alerting. Nature sounds or classical music are relaxing versus hard rock or dance music, which are very alerting. So if you've got a kid who has a hard time waking up in the morning, having his favorite dance music or pop or electronica on during breakfast can really help him get up and get moving and get ready for school. If, however, you've got a bunch of little kids who have worked themselves into a frenzy on the playground and now you have a 20 to 30 minute drive home in traffic, Maybe put on the Enya or the Mozart to help them calm down and maybe they'll conk out before they get home. Auditory defensive children uh, tend to talk loudly because they are fearful of loud noises. And so they're trying to drown out everything else with one of the few things that they can stand the sound of, which is their own voice. Now, TLP and ILS are the listening program and the integrated listening system. These are specialized listening programs with specially recorded music listened to with very specific headphones that will help retrain the brain in how to listen and hear. We here at Bothell Pediatric and Hand Therapy do have some people trained in the use of these systems and there is some training needed to go into using them regularly. They must be used in a very specific way. And as I said, they are, again, working on restructuring the neurological system. Uh, another thing that can be useful are noise-canceling headphones. These are great because they're easily portable and they're easy to find. You can, you can look up noise-canceling headphones. You can find them on therapy websites like therapyshop.com or um, Southpaw. 
and all you do is the kid pops them on when they're about to go into a noisy environment like Fred Meyers or uh, a playground or the cafeteria and they filter out loud and background noise so they're not as distracting. The other nice thing about them is most noise canceling headphones do not filter out conversation level speech. And finally, you can also use white noise machines to help cancel out some background noise that is distracting. Uh, you can do radios tuned between settings, so you just get a little um, static fuzz, a tabletop rock fountain, aquariums, even just having a fan on at night can help someone with auditory processing sleep better. Then we have visual input, what we see and how it's perceived. Uh, children who are easily distracted work better in a quieter environment, both auditorily and visually. So if an uh, environment is highly distracting, then simply simplifying the visual field by removing the clutter or uh, covering it with a sheet if you can have a separate area, a separate room that has little to nothing on the wall, just the child's workspace, that can be really helpful. Not always the best in classrooms, but in the home environment for homework, really nice. Someone who is a low responder might do better with increased visual stimulation with bright colors and moving objects. These kids would probably respond really well to like learning to read and write through a tablet where letters can change colors um, after something is written or completed, having something bloom or something move, uh, that kind of thing can be very, very rewarding for them. For calming, you can look at things like lava lamps, glitter wands, an aquarium, that kind of thing, where things just move gently or in certain patterns. Uh, if you have a child who is easily distracted, having solid colors will be easier on them than patterns. Kids who have difficulty seeing things in a busy environment, they'll also work much better with solid colors versus patterns. The patterns will just be confusing. And then we have smell, to, which is good for stimulating or calming, uh, but you got to be careful because it can lead to overload. So for aromatherapy, lavender, vanilla, and rose are generally calming. Things like peppermint and lemon are alerting. When and if you are going to use aromatherapy, be aware not only of what you're trying to do with the smell, whether it's to relax someone or to alert them, but also their responses. Some kids really cannot deal with extra odors in the room. Some of them have asthma. The other thing is use very, very simple scents. If you want it to be alerting, just use lemon or pine. If you want it to be calming, have just vanilla, just lavender, something very soft. Combinations of scents can more easily overload a system, leading to headaches, asthma attacks, vomiting, and just generally trying to escape from the environment. You can also use scents to, uh, to help kids get through areas that they have to go through that don't smell good. So say they need to go into like a hospital or the dentist office, which they have very strong, fairly unpleasant scents of, of um, sterility around them. You can give them a cloth that has a scent that they enjoy, especially a calming one. Again, the vanilla, uh, the lavender, basil is actually really calming. And just put it, put it over their nose and mouth. Okay, the child holds it over their own nose and mouth and, you know, let them be in control. Then we have oral motor and taste. Taste is influenced by smell, which is why if a kid doesn't like how something smells, they're probably not gonna try and eat it. And the mouth is actually the most organizing part of the body. We use our mouth from birth onwards, and that is the most organizing part of our body. And actually, we use our mouth before birth. Uh, there are plenty of instances of 
people with pictures of their child in utero sucking on their thumb or their hand. With our mouths, we chew, bite, suck, swallow, lick, and blow. And chewy and sweet foods are calming, such as gum, chocolate, uh, dried fruit is really good. And then crunchy and spicy foods are alerting, so things like a good crunchy granola or granola bar, uh, something spicy or sour like lemons are also good for waking up. And then uh, drinking through a straw, whether it's from a water bottle or a regular straw, is also really good for being both alert and organized. And it, the more you have to use the muscles in your mouth, the better. So sucking a thick liquid through a straw, such as a Frosty or uh, a milkshake or a uh, fruit smoothie, is really, really organizing. And then finally, you really want to be aware of food allergies and sugar content. Um, and not only the type of allergies that lead to, you know, ha having to take some Benadryl and itchiness or even um, a trip to the ER because of a severe peanut allergy, but also food sensitivities. Um, if you suspect your child has a food sensitivity, please see a doctor or a and or a nutritionist, because they're the ones who are gonna be really able to test your child, figure out exactly what food sensitivities and to what extent they are, and really get you set up with the diet that is going to be most helpful for, for the child. And when there is a problem with food sensitivities, getting the child on the right diet is very important because the results are amazing. But at the same time, if the child does not have a food sensitivity, it is a lot of effort and money for specialized food substances, uh, such as tapioca flour, rice flour, gluten and casein-free items that you, know, you don't have to spend. So please make sure your child's nutritional needs are being met correctly. And then of course, there are plenty of children who are sensitive to uh, an increase in sugar in their diet and should be aware of that as well. So going back to doing heavy work, which is our big muscle activities, pushing, pulling, sit-ups, push-ups, all the fun stuff we remember so fondly from gym class. You want to remember the three things when doing them. First is the intensity. How much and to what level do you want the child to do something? The duration, how long should it be done for? And the frequency, how often can it be done? So you want to make sure that these are kind of at a just right level, too low and the system isn't being activated enough and they're not getting the benefit, too high and you're just, exha ja bleh, you're just exhausting the kiddo or possibly causing injury from like muscle fatigue. So now we're going to look at sensory modulation versus behavior regulation. Sensory modulation is a bottom-up treatment system. So at the bottom of everything is sensory, or at least that's how I feel. So you want to use the sensory input to affect your change in focus, attention, and self-concept. We're, we're working on the very basic bits of the pe person. You want to provide a sensory diet, and then you want to provide environmental modification. And OTs are great at all of these. And then for behavioral regulation, that's a top-down thing. It's, it starts with uh, the brain, intellect, the thinking part of the brain as opposed to the feeling part of the brain. So you try and think it through with willpower alone. And we use behavior modification or behavior plans and rules and consequences. And both of these systems work really well together uh, because with... Sensory modulation, we give the kids the tools they need to help regulate themselves. And with behavior regulation, we give them um, the rules and expectations So, and how to use those tools. So ABCs of dealing with behavior. First, we have A, the antecedent which are actions prior to the behavior. Behaviors do not just come out of nowhere. They are always in response to something. So what happened before the behavior? Then there's the behavior itself. What was the behavior? Was it yelling, hitting, kicking, screaming, biting, what? And then the consequences. 
what happened because of the behavior. Did the child, and these are both what immediately happened, whether it was, you know, they, they hurt their toe or, you know, the person bothering them went away, and the other consequences such as, you know, losing privileges. And finally, the function. What is the behavior trying to get the child? Or what is the child trying to get through this behavior? Now, for me, when I look at the function of the behavior, uh, I use a term called METS, M-E-A-T-S, and each of those letters stands for something. M is for medical, always think medical first. What is going on? Uh, this is especially important in children who have a difficult time communicating because if they can't tell you that their head or their stomach hurts, a lot of the time uh, they will use behavior to try and signal that something is wrong. Then we have E, which is escape. They're trying to get away from something uh, or they're trying to make you go away. A, oh, I always have trouble remembering A. A is attention. So they are trying to get your attention. Uh, this can easily be seen in some of those active kids that negative attention, positive attention, if you're yelling at them or you're hugging them, you're still giving them attention and that's what they want. T is a tangible. They actually want something, whether it's food, a toy, something like that. They're trying to get it. And then finally, S is sensory. Something doesn't feel right, something... They're just trying to meet a sensory need that is not otherwise being met. So those are some functions of behavior. When dealing with behaviors, you want to use positive strategies. You want to have a positive relationship with the child, so you try and remain calm during the behavior. Especially for the kids who really want attention. I have worked with kids who think that you getting mad is hysterical, so they'll try and make you mad because it's entertainment for them. Be aware of your own shortcomings so that you know what your responses usually are uh, and you can respond calmly and without reinforcing the negative behavior. Again, don't get angry. Finally, the, oh, not finally, next, preferred sensory activities and choices. Children show less social avoidance in preferred activities and engage in less problematic behaviors when given choices. So, Limited choices, Cho two or three things that you are okay with them doing. So it's, do you want to have a ham sandwich or do you want a peanut butter sandwich for lunch? And if the child says, I want McDonald's, you can tell them, well, your choices are ham cheese or peanut butter. You are, you are not the bad guy by not getting them a happy meal. Promote communication, language, and social skills. Improved communication, language, and social skills significantly reduce disruptive, self-injurious, aggressive, and stigmatizing behaviors. And speech therapy can be very important for children with behavioral and communication problems. Oftentimes, these kids do not naturally learn social cues the same way most children do. So by having a social group, especially one led by uh, a good speech therapist, can be really, really helpful because they're in a much smaller group and they have a person there who can carefully guide them through learning about all of those little social nuances that most of us learn through experience, but some of us have to learn just like most people have to learn how to divide by fractions. Another good thing to do is to teach a stop signal, uh, either just a you know just holding your hand out stop, or having a printed out stop sign to use instead of other behavioral signals. Uh, the need to stop what they are doing, pay attention to you, that kind of thing. So some more positive strategies: have physical structure. Only have the toys out that you want a child to use in an area. Don't have the others out. Don't have them visible. Have locked cabinets, and that way the environment is saying no, not you. It's like, oh, this cabinet's locked. Yep, can't get in there. Hmm. Uh, and also having a daily schedule. Uh, these are really easy to make. You can use a whiteboard. You can use a picture schedule by just taking a picture of things. Uh, and if you add some uh, sticky back Velcro, you can put them on and off of a 
either a sheet of cloth or another piece of paper that has sticky back Velcro on it. Um, you can also have limited access to things or AM and PM bins of toys. So, you know, you can limit things without making yourself the toy jailer. Also, having a quiet area available is important. This can be a tent or a large cardboard box or even just a specific area in a room. It should have minimal stimulation, low lighting, maybe a, in the case of a tent or a cardboard box or, you know, an empty closet. Um, you can use a flashlight or a nightlight. Uh, cushions, beanbag chairs, blankets, bean, uh, anything that's comforting, quiet. A kid can go in there and read a book and just chill out. Uh, never, ever use this area as a timeout zone. This is not for punishment. You do not want to have a negative... You do not want to have a negative area. Um, sorry. You do not want this to be a negative place ever. Uh, you also want, do want rules. Teaching kids rules start basic when they're really little and then get more complicated as they get older and stick to the rules. Be consistent. Uh, if you have older children uh, and younger children, the older children will help set the rules. Trust me, they will remember that when they were their little brother or sister's age, they weren't allowed to get away with certain things and they'll tell you in detail. An offer you can't refuse, excuse me, there's, it's been a little loud out there, so thank you for your patience. So make an offer that they can't refuse. Don't battle with them. Give them two choices. One is better than the other, but neither is exactly what they want. So for example, if two kids are fighting over a toy, you can, you can share that toy or you can watch me put the toy away. Those are your choices. Oh, you're going to play? Great. Have fun. Bye. Redirection. Mothers who describe their preschoolers as having behavioral problems use less redirection. Using less redirection associated with the development of greater permanent behavior problems. Redirection is better than a time out with preschoolers. So you got a three or four year old and they're starting to get upset about something. So maybe, oh, they don't want to go home. You know, they don't want to go home. They're, they're having fun playing where they're playing, but it's time to go home and they don't want to go home. Oh, well, you know, we have popsicles at home. Oh, okay. We got to go home to get the popsicle. Or, you know, you have something they enjoy at home. Just make sure that the thing you tell them that is going to be going to happen when they get home happens. Because they'll remember. They're not going to believe you the first time, you, you know, after the first time that you were wrong. More positive strategies for behavioral interventions. Consequences. There should be consequences and they should fit the behavior. If it's a minor infraction, don't bring out your heavy guns because what are you going to do for a major infraction? And the kids, the kids will know that. So, you know, if you didn't do, you know, oh, you don't take the computer away because they forgot to put their dishes in the sink. You can say you can have the computer after you put the dishes in the sink and that gives them a motivation. Things like that. So loss of privileges. Follow through and set out a clear time that the privilege is lost. Do not forget. If you're not consistent, your kids aren't going to be consistent and they're going to know that they can get away with more. So say something happens, they have, uh, you know, they have a fight with their brother. So they have lost computer privileges for three days. Do not give it after one day. Do not give it after two days. They're going to ask. But once you do that, they're going to learn that either it doesn't matter, they can still get in a fight with their brother and have computer, or they're going to learn that if they beg for something, they can get what they want. Natural consequences. I love natural consequences. Uh, these are things that simply happen, not because you did anything, but because they made poor choices. So, you know, oh, I don't like this anymore. You know, I don't want to put this away, so I'm going to throw it out. You can't have it back. It's in the garbage. You throw food on the ground, it goes in the trash, and you don't get to eat it. It's because of what they did. You didn't do anything they did. It's wonderful. And then having a positive behavior chart. These are great. 
You give kids rewards for good behaviors. Uh, you can vary this depending on the age of the child. And you set the reward as something they want, but it starts small. I mean, you shouldn't be taking it. You shouldn't be taking the child out to McDonald's or for a new Ninja Turtle toy at Target every time they, you know, they, they tie their shoes. Or, okay, the first time they tie their shoes, oh my goodness, yes. But not every single time. So make it simple to earn it first and then up the amount to get rewards. So stickers, stars, check marks, a punch card. Uh, if they work better with tangible objects, a jar that you can put marbles in, that kind of thing. And after so many stickers, marbles, punches, whatever, you get your reward. And as they get better, the amount they need to get the reward goes up. And you can adjust it by age and function level. So we have several OT-directed programs for behavioral modification. Uh, the one we most commonly use here is the alert program, or how does your engine run? And this is a very simple, basic idea of we all have an engine in our body. It's like a car or a train. And sometimes our engines go too slow. And when our engines go too slow, we might be sick or sad or sleepy. And sometimes they go too fast. And when they're too fast, we might be silly or angry or loud or scared. And we really want them to be just right. We want to be in the middle where we're happy and we're listening and we're learning and we're having fun. And by starting with this and giving them this tool that kids start to be able to monitor how they're feeling and where their energy level is. Then we have social stories created by a speech therapist named Carol Gray. And these are really interesting because they're very simple stories about a specific thing, a specific thing that a child has trouble with, whether it's you know eating too much candy or riding the bus and they talk about what the consequences of the reaction are and what a better choice is. And then we read this story before or after something involving the area of difficulty is. So for example, uh, for a child who just wants, you know, has a poor diet, it might go something like, I like to eat candy. Sometimes I eat too much candy. When I eat too much candy, my teeth hurt and my tummy hurts. Next time, instead of eating candy, I will have fruit instead. Fruit will help me be healthy and keep my teeth from hurting. And then we might read this before meals or before snack choices. Or after an incident where the child overindulged in candy and now that they're, you know, now that they're feeling better, we have to talk about it again. And we have the Cat Kit by Tony Atwood. Tony Atwood has done a lot of amazing research and work with teaching uh, emotions and social skills to children on, with autism spectrum disorders, and CAT stands for Cognitive Effective Training. So it's really, teach again, teaching children and adolescents how to monitor their feelings and their behaviors and giving them some control over themselves. Then we have social skills groups. We talked about this a little bit earlier. We might have between two and five children of the same age range function level in directed play and activities to learn things like sharing, turn taking, and conversational skills. And finally, we have Brain Gym, which uh, are home programs and classroom programs just designed to uh, give sensory breaks to kids throughout the day to make sure, again, those energy levels stay in the just right area. And that concludes this presentation. Uh, you can email any questions to me uh, at betht at bpnht.com. And I really hope you enjoyed hearing my disembodied voice. Have a good afternoon. And if you do have other sensory concerns, uh, please feel free to give BPNHT a call and we'd be glad to set you up with consultation or evaluation to help you and your child. Thank you and have a great day.